and they love to have it taught. And I'm thankful to be a part of this lectureship and to honor in the biblical sense of honoring godly elders that love the truth and that back the truth and make plans for it being taught in their school of preaching and in all the work they do. And to be with Wendell and have this opportunity to share with you the Word of God is really a thrill. Though Brother Malone had to leave immediately afterwards, I must say in response to one of the nicest compliments I've ever received by anybody publicly, that if I did have an influence and impact upon his life, it was one of the best things I ever did. Because all the good he has done for 30 years now proclaiming the gospel of Christ, it gives me a lot of joy just to think that I may have had something to do with helping him. However, after I encouraged him to begin doing what he should have been doing a long time, preach the gospel, uh, he would borrow my sermon outlines. But within six weeks, he could out-preach me, so I didn't let him know where I was living anymore. <laughs> I am thankful for the privilege, but I'm sorry that Brother Warren is ill, and we certainly want to remember him and others in our prayers. Based upon the lesson that we have just heard, the masterful address on the deity of Christ, we begin with Luke 179, where Christ came to bring light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide their feet in the way of peace. In John 8, 12, our Lord affirmed, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The light shineth in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not, John 1, verse 5. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1, verse 7. He brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Read 2 Timothy 1, verse 10. In Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. John 3.19 says, Though the light shineth in darkness, those who were in error really preferred darkness over light because their deeds were evil. Jesus Christ, the greatest who ever lived. Philippians 2 says, verse 8, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and hath given him a name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And yet, in spite of all the light that he brought to the Roman Empire, the ancient world, soon the shadow of darkness overwhelmed the world. Error, apostasy, set in. The word apostasy means to fall away from or to depart, to defect, a failure to stand, to abandon one's principles or the faith one voluntarily possessed. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30, God said of his people, their reprobate silver, counterfeit coin, good for nothing. In Hebrews 3, 12, in the heart of the first century, just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, to Hebrew Christians, this admonition was given, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 2 Peter 3, 17 says, take heed lest you fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When the evil Jeroboam said in 1 Kings 12, 28, we have obeyed God long enough, we've gone up to Jerusalem long enough, an apostate atmosphere overwhelmed the people. Hosea 5, 10 cries, leave the landmarks alone. And in Jeremiah 6, 16, the weeping prophet of Anatos said, Stand in the ways and seek the old paths wherein is the good way and walk therein. But they said, we will not walk therein. The purpose of this entire lectureship is to call attention to the beauty and power and grandeur of the Word of God. And the opposite side of that is how apostasy comes, what made the dark ages dark, and how we need to use the sacred text to overwhelm error that usually began and today begins within the church. And thus we need to be great students of the Holy Scriptures and courageous servants of God in the army of the Lord to learn the book and to share it faithfully with others, to uphold the Christ and oppose that which opposes him. 
Ephesians 5.11 tells Christians, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the landmark chapter on this point, we learn that the day of the Lord, the end of the world, shall not come except there be a falling away first, and the man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God, sitting in the temple of God, setteth himself forth as God. And with great lying wonders he'll deceive the very elect. In that context, Paul said the mystery of lawlessness was already at work in the first century, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. And the characteristic of those who would apostatize would be that they would receive not a love of the truth that they might be saved. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. And they received, instead of truth, a strong delusion that they might believe a lie and be condemned instead of the truth that was at their fingertips but that they turned against. In Hebrews 4.12, we read the word of God that's quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and intent of the heart. And as we open the word of God, we see some light shed on how apostasy comes denominational thinking that foments and grows until absolute error, sectarianism, enters the realm where only truth should be. We think of the attitude of those at the Tower of Babel who said, let us make a name for ourselves, Genesis chapter 11. We think of the Israelites who left Egypt in one night but couldn't get Egypt out of them for 40 years, who said, give us a king that we may be like the nations round about us. How desperately they needed the word of God. Let me share with you several great passages that show the urgency of standing for the truth, the urgency of opposing error. And then we'll notice together three things, then and now, that produced and will reproduce the dark ages and a leaving of the sacred text. Remove not the ancient landmark. Proverbs 22, 28. Philippians 1, 17, Paul said from a prison cell in Rome, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. And in Galatians 1, 89, he said, but though we are an angel from heaven preaching to you any other gospel than that we have delivered unto you, let him be accursed. And then he repeated it again. Some of my brethren know so little gospel they would know it was another one, a perversion of the real one or what? You talk about difficult passages in the Bible. Some of my brethren don't know the Bible enough to know that there are any difficult ones or easy ones or what's in there. And so in the midst of this lectureship, we need to get our heads and hearts back in the book. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Add thou not to his word, lest he prove thee, and thou be found a liar. And the verse before it said, For every word of God is pure. Peter spoke for all of us when he said we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5, 29. And to the religious elite of his day, Jesus made it clear that a lack of Bible knowledge caused their error. You do greatly err, he said to the Sadducees, not knowing the scriptures, neither the power of God. In John 2, 5, Mary said of Christ, do whatever he tells you to do. But we cannot know what he's told us to do by dreams and visions and lights-out devotionals and super-emotionalism. We can only learn that in the sacred text. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. Therefore, we need to know all the Bible thoroughly and be in love with the author of that book, God himself. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Jesus made it clear that prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, there would even be false Christs upon the earth, Matthew 24, 24. He said there would be false prophets who would come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they were ravenous wolves. Matthew 7, 15, and 16. Later to the church at Ephesus, he said, You have tried those who claim to be apostles and have found them false. Revelation 2, 2. 
Brethren, does the average member of the church in our day know enough Bible to point out error, to mark those who claim to be Christ, the prophet of God, or an apostle of the Lord? We can't teach what we don't know. And thus, we need to learn the book from cover to cover. In 1 John 4, 1, John warned many false prophets have already gone out into the world. In 2 Peter 2, 1, he said there were false prophets among the people. There'll be false teachers among you. And yet today, when faithful gospel preachers even quote that verse, people say, oh, you've got a persecution complex. You're negative. We need to understand that there are still false prophets in the world and some false teachers among us. And the only way they can be marked is by a knowledge of the sacred text. I mentioned the godly elders here, their vigilance with the flock. That's exactly what Paul commanded the elders of Ephesus. Take heed unto yourself and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of the Lord which he hath purchased with his own blood. He said, even from your own selves shall men arise teaching perverse things. Draw away disciples after them. Then his parting word was this. Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It would be a mistake tonight for us to only focus in on the errors that men make in the religious world concerning the word of God. Now that's important, like the lesson on the deity of Christ and being armed against Jehovah's Witnesses and others who do not believe in the deity of Christ. But we need to understand that even within the body of Christ, there are those who must be committed to and commended to the Holy Scriptures and have their heads and hearts therein. Avon quoted over and again, Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you. And he's writing to the church at Colossae, not to the world in Colossae, to the church at Colossae. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world, after the traditions of men, and not after Christ. Thus, we need to be on guard and search the sacred text thoroughly from one end to the other, from Genesis through Revelation. Again, to brethren, not to the world. Hebrews 13, 8 and 9 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, be not carried away by divers' doctrines. We need to be equipped with the word and have the proper attitude toward it. In Acts 13, 46, to those in Antioch of Pisidia, after Paul's first public address as a gospel preacher, he said, seeing you count yourselves unworthy of eternal life and thrust the word of God from yourselves. Notice how counting yourself unworthy of eternal life and dispensing with the word of God go together. One of the quickest ways to guarantee that we'll fall from grace is to quit studying the message of grace, the word of God. In Acts 17, 11, these in Berea, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Brethren and friends, the reason we must ever be on guard and be vigilant and knowledgeable is the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know what the next verse says? Whom resist ye steadfast in your faith. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. And you can't withstand the devil steadfast in the faith, in your faith, without a knowledge of the word. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Don't give place to the devil. Ephesians 5, 27. Don't allow him, or 4, 27. Do not allow him a launching pad in your life. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan gain advantage over us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Read of the snare of the devil in 1 Timothy 3.7. And yet today I hear even members of the church talking about Bible bangers, those who love the Bible, as if there's something wrong with loving the Bible and preaching the Bible. The psalmist said, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And later in that same chapter, that's verse 97, but later in that same chapter, the 119th Psalm, he said, Thy word is true from the beginning, or the sum of thy word is true. I stand in awe of thy word. Part of it, 
all of it. When? All the time. And so tonight, as we discuss difficult passages in the Bible, we need to understand that some people aren't even aware of the simple, straightforward, direct ones that equip us fully to stand against the wiles of the devil, Ephesians 6, 11. We mentioned the Dark Ages. I believe the best period of the Dark Ages, and I understand some brethren think it's got to be 1,230 to 1,260 years. I understand that because I believe they misunderstand Revelation chapter 12 and that meaning. But I believe the best possible period to be consistent with history on the Dark Ages would be to begin those years in the year 476 when the Roman Empire fell and the Roman Church gained the ascendancy. In fact, I believe that's what he's talking about in 2 Thessalonians 2, that there was one, some power withholding this man of sin, the son of perdition, and when that power was removed, he would come to the forefront. In the year 476, the Roman Empire fell, and the Roman Catholic Church gained the ascendancy. Thus, 476 could be the beginning of the Dark Ages, and 1455, when Gutenberg's printing press came, about a thousand years later, and broadcast the Bible... 50,000 copies at one time is over against one copy per year by a man who had to write it by hand. The dark ages began to crumble and God's light began to be shown. And superstition and error of popery crumbled into European soil, into the dust. And God's light shone forth. It's significant that that 1,000 year period that we just mentioned is called by the Roman Catholic Church, quote, the golden age of the Catholic Church, unquote. When the world is in darkness, the Roman Catholic Church is in the ascendancy. But when the word of God is known and thoroughly digested, Romanism's in trouble. We have the Renaissance, the resurgence, the rebirth of learning that preceded the Reformation movement that broke the shackles of popery to some extent in Europe. And following that, the restoration movement. But what produced those 1,000 years of darkness? Do you remember how we began tonight? Christ came to give light to those who sit in darkness. He is the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the light shineth in darkness. The darkness comprehended not. The darkness loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. What three major contributions produced the Dark Ages? And I'm going to tell you now, as they're unfolded briefly here, you're going to see 1980, USA, Fort Worth, Texas, marching back. We're not talking about something that happened once upon a time far, far away in a fairy tale that didn't really happen. What produced the Dark Ages? Number one, everybody doing his own thing. What was the darkest period of Old Testament history? The period of the Judges? What happened there? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges 21, 25. Judges 17, verse 6. In Deuteronomy 12, 8, Moses speaking for God said, You shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man that which is right in his own eyes. Why? When men seek to establish their own righteousness, they will not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. That's why. Romans 10, verse 3. And every way of man is right in his own eyes, Proverbs 21, 2. But there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, the end thereof are the ways of death, Proverbs 14, 12. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. Are you aware of the rest of that quotation that we often use, Joshua 24, 15? He said, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the river are the gods of the Amorites in whose land did dwell, but as for me and my house, we'll serve Jehovah. There is a distinctiveness between what they do and the world does and what we must do. And yet I see more and more of the world in the church and less and less distinctive preaching teaching, and Bible study among us. Do we want the dark ages to return? Jeremiah wept, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. 
In Leviticus 1, 3, the, 1, 3, the Bible says, of your own voluntary will, meaning you have the ability, the will to choose to do God's will or to do your own thing. That was one of the mottos in 1970 across the U.S., do your own thing. We heard it on TV, saw it in the newspaper. Boys and girls used that language constantly. And the demons in hell shouted with glee. And so tonight we need to get back to doing God's will. Jesus said, if any man wills to do my will, he shall know if the teaching be of God. John 7, 17. Paul bewailed the fact that some that he had led out of error were returning to the beggarly elements of the world. He said, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed labor upon you in vain. Galatians 4, 9 through 11. We are to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do thus and so. James 4, 15. Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, 38. In the shadow of the cross, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Matthew 26, 42. In his beautiful prayer to the Father, he said, I have glorified thee upon the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. John 17, 4. One of our problems in the church today, just being honest, is we don't have a, very many people in most congregations, and I know elders and preachers and Bible teachers will say the amen to this, not very many people in very many congregations that are studying the Bibles anymore. And that is a reflection of this point, whether you understand it to be or not. Why are we not studying our Bibles more? We're going to do what we want to do. And that's not what we want to do. What do we want to do? Go blind and watch an idiot box. We do not have very many people anymore that are Bible students, much less Bible scholars. And the old walking Bible of the past, the average member of the church was called that. He's not called that anymore. And then in a lot of pulpits, not enough Bibles preached to save a peanut. And in some Bible classes, you search in vain to find a Bible. Everyone doing his own thing. And so the dark ages ensued. Nadab and Abihu were consumed by fire that went out from heaven because they offered to God what they wanted to offer instead of what he wanted them to offer. Secondly, the dark ages came because so many people laughed at sin. According to Isaiah 5.20, the people of seven centuries before Christ made truth error and light darkness, and they laughed at the things they ought to weep about and wept over the things they should have laughed about. They had their values all mixed up. They laughed at sin instead of weeping over it. And today... We have members of the church, when you preach a strong sermon on getting back the Bible and leaving off worldliness and abstaining from social drinking and dancing and immodesty, they say, oh, that's not so bad. Don't tell me you haven't heard that. Too many people laugh at sin. Fools make a mock of sin. But the way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs 13, 15, Proverbs 14, 9. Like those in Zephaniah's day, many rise up early to corrupt all they're doing. Zephaniah 3, 7. Is it a light thing to you, all you who work abomination? Ezekiel 8, 17. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Lamentation 1, 12. And they laughed Jesus to scorn. Mark 5, verse 40. In Isaiah 28, 15, the prophet said, You make lies your refuge. In Romans chapter 1, in speaking of those who both lied and enjoyed hearing a lie, he said, they do not like to retain God in their knowledge. Wherefore, God gave them up to reprobate minds. Romans 3.18 warns us, when there is no fear of God before our eyes, what is the result? Separation from God because of sin, Romans 3.23. Jeremiah, as he did on so many other subjects, probably said it best of all. Jeremiah 3.25, we lie down in our shame and our confusion covers us. We have sinned against God, we and our fathers, my youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Later he said in Jeremiah 17.1, write the sin of Judah with an indelible pen. And finally in chapter 51, verse 5, Jeremiah would write the whole land 
is full of sin. Psalm 4.4 4 says, Stand in awe and sin not. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Zechariah chapter 7 depicted people of that day and of our day. Their heart is like an adamant stone. God said, I called upon you and you wouldn't hear. Now you call upon me and I won't hear. For your heart is like an adamant stone. You've laughed at sin so long, you're insensitive to righteousness. That's the point. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. Read Ezekiel 18, 20. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. Isaiah 57, verses 20 and 21. And ultimately, sin separates a man from God. Isaiah 59, 1. Cause him to be dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 1. Without hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. And so Christians are warned. Christians are warned. Exhort one another every day, lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3, 13. There is none righteous, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. The poison of asp is under their lips. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And what reward have you in those things you're now ashamed of? Romans 3, 10, and 13, and 23, and Romans 6, 21, and 23. Rebellious children add sin to sin. Isaiah 30, verse 1. Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, 23. And the worldliness in the church tonight is proof that sin will find you out. What made the dark ages dark? Everyone doing his own thing, and people laughing at sin, but the Bible says, cast your bread upon the water and it will return not many days hence. Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. And when you sowed the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. Hosea 8.7. And when you sowed the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. And Ephesians 4 wraps it up. Verses 17 to 19. They are past feeling. That's what made the dark ages dark. And that's what plagues America and the church tonight. And the only remedy, the only answer, is learning the Bible, loving it, living it, sharing it, and taking a stand for it, all of it. And that brings me to the last point. I'm telling you, if he had waited until 4.30 to call me, I'd really have a sermon. Because I had a few things I wanted to say. He just gave me a little bit too much time. Ignorance of the Bible made the dark ages dark. That's why people laugh at sin. They don't have their priorities right. They don't know the difference in right and wrong. Hebrews 5 says, For when for the time you, speaking to Christians, ought to be teachers, you have need that someone come again and teach you, which be the first principle of the oracle of God. He said you're still on the milk and can't take the strong meat, and as a result you don't even know the difference in right and wrong. In Hosea 4, 6, we read, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then toward the end of the book, he said, O Israel, you've destroyed yourself. Hosea 13, 9. And the quickest way for the church of our Lord to quit being the church of the Lord is for us to destroy ourselves through a lack of Bible knowledge. In Isaiah 5, 13, we read, You've gone into bondage because of your ignorance. In Acts 3, on Solomon's porch, and J.W. McGarvey said at least 20,000 people could have gathered there, and I wouldn't be surprised if every bit as many as that was present. Peter said, through ignorance, you crucified the Lord of glory. But it was willful ignorance, 2 Peter 3, 5, for they had to repent of it. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, he said, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why didn't they know it? Same reason some of us don't know more than we know. Same reason some of our neighbors wouldn't know the Bible and the almanac. Like my Lutheran landlady in Nina, Wisconsin years ago. I said, what do you believe about infant baptism? She said, whatever my prayer book says. And I said, well, where is it? And she said, I don't even know where it is. And I said, can I find it for you? She said, yeah. And I said, look up in the index and find out what I'm supposed to believe on it. If you think I'm kidding you, that's exactly the way it went. I had to find her prayer book 
which was her replacement for the Bible, that she didn't even know where it was or what it said. But when I found out and read it, she said, that's what I believe. Poor old ignorant woman. And that's about the way some of my brethren are. They don't know where the Bible is. They wouldn't know how to look up a passage. And they're so unfamiliar with doing God's will that they alone create a lot of darkness in this age. 2 Timothy 2.15 conversely tells us to be diligent, studious, servants of God, handling a right, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that takes effort. And yet some of my brethren will break out in a rash and have to go home or take a half a block detour to get away from a Bible class that demands something of them and from a teacher that has assignments and wants to help them grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. In Luke 24, 32, as Jesus parted company with the two men on the road to a mess, isn't it a blessed thing, they say? Did not our hearts burn within us when he opened unto us the scriptures and talked with us by the way? Jeremiah 15, 16 reads, His words were found, and I did eat them. And they were the rejoicing of my heart. In Jeremiah 8, 9, he said, Where are the wise men? He said, They are not wise if they do not know the word of God. In Jeremiah 17, 15, he cried, Where is the word of the Lord? In Jeremiah 37, 17, the people asked, Is there any word from the Lord? And in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, that great prophet said, After having been slapped in the face for preaching the word of God, His word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and could not contain. Two chapters later, in chapter 22, verse 29, Jeremiah said, A word, earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord. In Jeremiah 23, 29, is not his word like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Bold, straightforward, unapologetic, demanding preaching and teaching emanates from the word of God. And we need not apologize for that. In the 119th Psalm, the writer said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. I'll not be ashamed to speak of thy word before kings. Forever, O Lord, is thy word established in the heavens. O oh, how love I thy Lord is my meditation all the day. The entrance of God's word giveth light. I stand in awe of God's word, and so should we. And when we do... The darkness of the ages will be dispelled and the glorious sacred light of the eternal text will be known. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4 4. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Matthew 24.35 The scripture cannot be broken. John 10.35 Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 15.3 the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. The seed of the kingdom is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. You're begotten by the Word of truth, 1 Peter 1, 22. And so Paul in clarion, challenging tones to his beloved son in the gospel said, as his parting writing inspired the Holy Spirit, I charge thee in the sight of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom? Preach the word. Be urgent in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. With all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But he said, you make full proof of your ministry. You do the work of an evangelist. Even though they want their back scratched and their ears tickled. You stick with the word. And how imperative it is. Notice, in closing, how the New Testament church reacted to the challenge of darkness and letting the light of Christ be seen. They went everywhere preaching the word. Acts 8, 4. They filled all Jerusalem with that doctrine. Acts 5, 28. And daily in the temple and from house to house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts 5, 42. And we are commanded to be ready always, to give answer to everyone that asks us a reason of the hope that's in us with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15.
That's what made the dark ages dark. Bible ignorance, laughing at sin, doing our own thing. And New Testament Christianity is the only remedy for the darkness of the ages. But it begins with you and with me. Do you study your Bible very much anymore? Those of us who are supported full-time as gospel preachers, do we study our Bibles nearly as much as we should, and does it reflect in our preaching and teaching, or do we read all the philosophers and psychoanalysts and theologians and everything except the Bible? Those of us who teach Bible classes, do we really teach Bible classes? Do we understand we have a mission, a purpose, a commitment to dispel darkness? Those in this audience who are elders, do you know enough Bible to convict and convince the gainsayer as you're commanded to do in Titus 1? And everyone in this house that claims to be an accountable being and claims to be a New Testament Christian, are we producing darkness or dispelling it? Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build us up and to give us an inheritance, an inheritance among those who are sanctified. We all need to do better than we're doing. Acts 2.41 says those who gladly received the word were baptized. Luke 7.29 says of evil men they rejected the counsel of God against themselves not being baptized. See the eternal difference? The separating line there, the line of demarcation, gladly receiving the word and rejecting the counsel of God. I hope and pray that we'll take the exhortations tonight. There are those in this audience who have never gladly received the word of God in the sense of Acts 2.41 and culminated your obedience by being baptized into Christ. How you need to yearn for truth. And have the courage to obey it, regardless of the cost. There are others here who need to be restored to their first love. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. To repent and pray, God, that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven you. Acts 8, 22. And all of us need to leave here tonight determined that we'll promise God Almighty if he gives us life and breath in just one more day. We'll get our heads and hearts back in the book and harmonize our lives therewith, that we might help save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Let us stand and say.